Thank you very much for coming. And today we are going to talk about about what uh, I need to share slides. So the the, uh, the strategy I am going to follow is to explain a bit of theory and just the talking about why we need the architecture and things beforehand. And then we are going to have some kind of real world uh, application. You can follow alongside with me and type a code, but it's not a requirement. I'm going to make it as smoother for you. You can just watch and then ask the questions in the middle as well. Um, yeah, that's the case. We are, uh, so this is the first time of mine to be in a PointCon conference. I'm quite excited. And again, thank you for coming. Uh, hexagonal Python services and how to build them. The, the today's agenda is about me and our Python user group. And then it's going to uh, a bit of historical reasoning, how it started yeah, about me, and a better way to teach complex topics. So we are constantly searching to teach people with uh, complex topics. And there's a kind of still um, have a better way, better room for that kind of things. And the few words about maintainable software, a few words about, uh, about the architectures, and then we get started with the uh, uh, with the coding. So Azerbaijan Python user community, it's uh, founded in 2015. We, uh, we are active in a, a Telegram and a Discord. The predominant communication language is Azerbaijani. And, and we do live streams, helping each other answering the questions and doing a local and online meetups, obviously. Uh, this is more <laughs> career waves. Uh, it's Okay, it cannot be interesting enough, but why are I calling this uh, the waves? Because there are a lot of waving in our life. And uh, my career just mirrored my life decisions, these kind of waves and curves. I started the Linux system admins and a bunch of things, dropping uh, master degrees and going through uh, the software engineering. And uh, four months ago, I have relocated to the Berlin as a senior software engineer, and I work for the North Security as a uh, yeah, senior software engineer in threat intelligence team. This is my ways. And it all started uh, from this wonderful book, uh, Standard C, in 2009. And uh, yeah, rest in peace, Dennis Ritchie, and thanks, Brian Kent, again, to give me a chance to change my life, actually. And first thing I built was a simplest of a calculator. And I cannot share this kind of exciting that all men as a code, it's compiled successfully. It's is a way that it gets an input, it adds two numbers, and wow, that was magic for me the first time. And uh, keeping in mind that, that uh, I've, I have graduated in a finance, this was a total new thing for me. So I didn't say any kind of code before. And then uh, after a decade, I found this book. It's Architecture Patterns with Python. And thanks again, Harry and Bob, for this wonderful uh, book. And uh, it, the samples, the sample code and applications I built in the, uh, in the book, it's uh, somehow complicated for new buys. And I just remember that the, what, how I started the first time. And it was a building of a calculator. And the question is that why not to build the same thing, but using enterprise architecture patterns? So just start with the simple, then go to the complex topics. And today we are going to build this kind of application, but uh, we are going to over-engineer things. Uh, OK, the question can be why to bother with an architecture patterns and other stuff. Uh, so the main topic is uh, what is a software maintenance. So you can develop the application or the product for two years. And if, obviously, somebody is going to use your product, you are going to still wait for in a maintenance state for 15, 20 years until you are going, I don't know, bankruptcy or somebody acquire you uh, and pay more money. Uh, this is a, the most crucial thing that to remember about the software. And there's a distribution of maintenance effort distribution for the software. And as you see, the 6 to 7% of the effort is going to maintain the software. 
And the people with a br brilliant mind came to, uh, to the solutions or what kind of maintenance uh, types we have. And the basically, uh, it is an endless loop. So we monitor, we enhance the software, we support the software, and then we bug a fixes. Uh, bug a fixes, fix a bugs. And uh, then uh, it's going uh, to continue with, uh, uh, with a loop. So what, is, uh, what does it mean so for enhancements? The people in the business can add a few features. They can um, add a support efforts for for your customers, or you have a bunch of bugs and you need to fix it. Uh, the next question is, uh, what is a maintainable software and how to ease this pro process? The maintainable software is a combination of testable, extensible, and understandable software, but you can add other elites, like observable software and other stuff also. So what is a testable, if the software is a Easy to test. It is a testable. Easy to change, modify, extend. That means it is extensible. And low cognitive load. When you onboard somebody, somebody new in your team, in your project, if it's a higher load of the cognitive uh, dissonance, that means that you have uh, a higher cognitive complexity, and it's not understandable at all. And if you combine all three, you get a maintainable software. And of course, this is not most easy in, in, in general. And uh, the people came around with the ideas how to simplify things. And they invented this onion clean and hexagonal architectures. The hexagonal architecture is, is a different name as ports and adapters. You can search for it as well. And the question is, what is common for all these architectures? Um, yeah, I'm asking you. Correct. The first commonality is direction of coupling or direction of dependencies. It goes from outside to inwards versus from inwards to outside. And uh, the second commonality, what you see here, what's a common? Uh, the all architecture centered the domain model. So this is the heart of the complexity of the software. This is the, where the business logic or the problem you are trying to fix sits there. And that's why they centered. It means that this is the most crucial part of your application. But as you say, there's other commonalities. The user interface, tests, frameworks, UI, database, external systems, I don't know, web frameworks are sit outside of the uh, architecture. That means there are details. We can see the database and the frameworks as a detail and it will be addressed when we really need it. So this is a crucial part about the architectures. Just focus on the domain model, or just focus on the business domain, what you are, your software is going to fi fix, what kind of solution you are going to, uh, to invent. Uh, yeah, the next is we have this app requirements, the wonderful app requirements. So our calculator should do, it should have fast API API support to add, subtract, multiply, and divide numbers. It should store the result of actions in the database. The calculator operates only with two numbers because it was easy to write. Um, to add, subtract, multiply, and divide are supported, only supported actions. So you have this kind of draft of the requirements. And uh, this, the, the first thing that the most of us is going to have, how do you want to start to build this application? And usually when you follow all the tutorials, they are directly starting from the database modeling, or they are directly starting from the uh, installing a framework, building an API, and going through all this help at the first hand. But uh, this is the way it's starting to go wrong. Let's just revert the ideas how we should act. What we do, we usually forget about. We forget about the business domain logic or this centralized section of the architecture, the core of the software, and how it should look like instead. It should look like this one. So we first start from the domain models, then go upwards to the layers. No framework yet, no database yet, and this is a crucial part of um, of architecture and the things. 
why I have two app requirements. Okay, this is, sorry. Um, we have an application that called this uh, hexagonal architecture. We can uh, right now install it and use it. And also there's a guide for the running test for running, uh, running a, a actual fast API and uh, flash things. But instead I would like to, um, to go directly to the, with the code and to start the code things. To get started, what we need? We need to create a folder, and I'm going to just copy from my, this, uh, from my slides. Uh, I have actually the terminal. The size is small, right? I need to increase. Okay, is it okay? Yeah. Yeah, good. And yeah, just create some kind of hexagonal calculator and go through the default. Then what we need, we need to jit in it as an empty repo. The second is we need to register as a remote uh, origin. Here, the way that we can do it, and we can verify remote, not remove, but remote V, and we have added this uh, remote repository as well. The second, the, the next step is uh, fetching the remote. Git fetch the remote. It's going to uh, fetch all the commit history as well. And for understanding the things that uh, you can grab all commit hashes from remote origin and the reverse order, that means we uh, the first commit is a uh, it is shown that it's the initial commit. And here is the output from the git log. And this is an initial commit, this is an initial commit of full just structures and other stuff. And we are going to use a different thing here. I'm going to cherry pick through the commit hashes. Uh, this is a new way that I'm trying to um, like to show you. And then we can just fire up our PyCharm. I use PyCharm. You can use different thing as well. But PyCharm has this uh, neat Git extension. That's a pretty useful. No, I don't want. And I need to remove this. Yeah? I have shared it in the, the, the Discord room I channel. Yes, I have shared the slides and report like there as well. Sorry. Font? F font bigger, okay. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I need to find how it was. Yeah, it's Control Alt S, I believe. And editor font. Yeah? Zoom, where? <laughs> okay. There's a control of S. Go uh, up to appearance. And appearance. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is it okay? You want, but okay. You want, you want more? Sure, sure, sure. Now it's better? Much better, thank you very much for, for helping me. And in order to get works, just we need the dummy, dummy first commit. So I'm going to create some kind of PyCon and PyCon TXT. And if we did check out B main and then get status, we have this uh, PyCon TXT and ID. I'm going to get add PyCon TXT and then get commit. This is a initial commit. And then we open, we can open this git 
And if we go, go to the main of the remote branch, we can see all this uh, commit history. And uh, what we can have here is an initial commit, and we can cherry pick this uh, change. If you hit inside, and this is a nice cherry icon, you can cherry pick, and that's it. So we have this first initial commit from our remote branch. This is just license git ignore and readme, nothing fancy. The second thing that we can cherry pick is the folder structure. And uh, let's go through the folder, folder structure. Our hexagonal architecture, uh, hexagonal calculator, have source and tests. Inside the source, we have domain. Inside the domain model, ports and adapters. And that's why it's called the hexagonal architecture. So the other name of this architecture is the ports and adapters. And this is a way that um, I'm going to follow the tutorial. Cherry picks the commits and explain. Is it OK for everybody? I, I guess it's a more, uh, yeah? Sorry, can you maybe turn off the light mode? Because the dark mode is just light gray or dark gray. Ah, oh, amazing. Lighter? Is it lighter? No, uh, yeah. It's the same for me, so I'm, oh no. Maybe material sandy. How about now? No? Um, material sky blue. It's the first time I'm checking those kind of things. Is it okay now? Good. Nice feedback from the people. So we have constructed our folder structure. The next is, as we have talked about uh, domain modeling, the centralizing our domains, and, and the, uh, if we go back to the app requirement, the app requirement states that a uh, calculator operates only with two numbers, and that means it's a core problem. We have eliminated the fast API side, we have eliminated the database side, and we directly going to address the domain modeling. And this is a, like creating a class for operands. And let me show you how, just simple enough. So add operands, it's just adding the model.py file. And if you cherry pick it, now we have this model pi. And the model pi is just a data class. Uh, in a term terminology, this is a value object, but just don't uh, stack with the terminology, it's a class. And the, the operands, it has left and right. And it has returning an, um, the, the, the hash, because to make it an hashable, and it has an equality check. We can see the operands to be equal only and only if the left and right values are equal together. The next, the next is to add, um, to add, Let's see what I'm going to add. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a this uh, strategy called to creating a domain factories, and it's just simply returning back the operands domain model. Uh, why it's powerful? You can add validation, domain validation, and extra things inside the operands factory instead of making this validation inside the class. Domain model should stay pure. An operands factory can handle all this validation stuff. And as we have the all kind of, why it's um, disabled. Uh, yeah, the next thing, of course, we have added uh, the first domain model, we have added the factory, that means we, not, we can add the unit tests. Nowhere without tests. The testing domain models. And testing domain models, the test if operands is created, test if operands is created with factory, and you can check with the names that it's intuitive. Test if operands is created with wrong types. And, uh, and this is a, the, the bunch of test suites that we have here. How to install and run a test? If you go to the uh, project TOML, we are going to build system as a fleet. We are going to use a fleet for our build system. And then you have a calculator after you, uh, OSIRS, I don't know, readme, dynamic, requires a Python, and dependencies. This is a production dependencies. And we are going to use dependency injector containers here. And that's why I just installed it beforehand. 
optional dependencies, the black eye sort auto flake, and other stuff that you need to have to have uh, in, a, in your project for common style, linting, checks, type checks, uh, security check, and other stuff. And for the test, we are going to use PyTest and PyTest Cockroach. And for the make file, uh, the PyCharm has also this neat uh, thing. So we have make, lint, make, test, coverage for all of things. And also we have this install dev. You can hit it. It fails for, ah, we have not a uh, virtual environment. Then we need to create it. Um, again, running this install dev. And now it says a normal model named fleet because we need to install the fleet for this. And uh, I'm going to source when bin activate and pip pip install 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 fleet three seven one. And then again, once again, I am trying to install the dev. It picks up all the dependencies. It installed everything for me. Um, it's trying to install, and we have finished. And now we can, what happened here? Okay, anyway. And now we can go to the terminal and run make test. And all our tests have been passed. This is a where, um, so it's, I stick with make files because it is, it's easy to develop with make files. But you can always run the comments directly, so no doubt there. We have added first bunch of tests. We have added our domain model, the next thing. The next thing, if you spot the domain model, it, it's going to, it, it has no validation on it. This is a, a quite um, like flow for us, and we need to address this. I'm going to use Marshmallow for the domain uh, validation. And uh, so nowadays, not everybody keen to use it like Pydantic things. But it's all, uh, the marshmallow also for serialization, deserialization, but it's also powerful for creating a DTOs. The DTO is a domain, um, is a data transfer object. And we add an abstraction over the domain model to validate. We do not uh, insert the validation inside the domain model. I just added, not this one. And here we create a schemas. And we, ins uh, we import the exclude schema fields from the marshmallow. And it's uh, just a schema with left and right. You specify they are required true. And also it has handy class meta, which is unknown exclude. If somebody tries to inject unknown field to our schema, it's going to just exclude, ignored. This is a case that we can use. And of course, we have a project TOML with, we have update, updated the dependencies, and that means we can run install dev to grab this dependency. And if we go back to schema, this is not a really thing here. How about model? We don't uh, even use it, but I believe I have added some tests here. Yes. Uh, we, have we have added the unit test for uh, creating a DTO, and we have this test if operands create, operands create DTO created. And we create it. The marshmallow works in this way. You first declare a schema, you then load the dictionary to the schema, and it's going through the validation. And if it's validated, it returns back the specified type of the dictionary. And this is a quite neat for API development as well. It just operates on a dictionary. It's quite intuitive. And test if operands create DTO can be created with wrong types. Uh, now we are going to uh, try to inject a wrong type, which is a left, is a list, and it fails with a marshmallow exceptions validation error. We have decoupled the validation from the domain models because it, 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 it's not responsibility of the domain models itself. Uh, the, again, that right side is if, if you try to insert a string, it's going to fail with the validation, validation error. And we can run this test as, again, make test. We have added five tests which all they passed. 
green, green, we like green. So next. The next is uh, adding more tests for, adding more tests for where, why it's stuck there. Okay, let's see. So add open create a marshmallow schema, we have added. Add more tests for operands create DTO. We have adding the bunch of, um, a bunch of uh, tests as well for the operands create DTO, which is quite, uh, so this one is new, test if operand create DTO can be created with extra fields. As you see, we are trying to inject an extra field to our schema, but it's going to exclude it because of this meta exclude. Quite wise. Uh, how about the models? Is it changed? No, I believe. Yes, now we are going to change our factory, domain factory, and let's cherry pick it. With the domain factory, we have the schema operands create DTO inside. We create a model of the operand and then validate inside the factory if it, uh, if it valid, validly created, the type of valid at, uh, at least, and we return back the model. So this is a, um, so just wrapping up, we have created the domain model operands. We have added a validation with Marshmallow schema. We have decoupled the validation logic outside of the domain model. Then we use operands factory to create the operands model with a validation. This is a, uh, yeah. This is the first thing that we have addressed. The question so far. Yeah, sure. Would you mind to repeat the question? The question was that FastAPI has built-in Pyidantic validation, and it's validated at the API uh, layer, right? Uh, but here we are validating the domain model. So the question is, could we explore it a bit more, right? Uh, the thing is, what I'm doing, I'm validating each layer on its own layer. So you should not delegate the validation to the upper sides. In terms of that, the service layer's validation should go alongside with the service layer. The domain model validation should go alongside the domain models. The use case validation should go with the use case, and API validation should go with the uh, API layer. And this is quite powerful. When you properly architecture things, when frameworks just forces you to use some kind of tool, you just can ignore them. And as you see at the end that we are using Marshmallow and we don't use PyDantic, but our fast API, API will, will work. So it's kind of, the so validation logic, it just goes alongside the each layer. Does it make sense? Or you need, okay, good. We have a few more short questions. Yeah, sure. Please, thank you. Um, one question is, do we need to know domain-driven development if we want to develop in hexagonal manner? Not at all. You can build an application without DDD. And as you see, we are using just small portions of DDD. So f with the DDD, there's a kind of aggregate, aggregate root, and other stuff that can be uh, developed. But here, uh, the mostly, I don't need such complexities. Um, but you can always use the DDD. Hexagonal architecture, Onion and the Clean, they are uh, pretty agnostic on what kind of internal architecture you are using. Uh, so the question is no, no need for DDD. For Thank the you. Hexagonal. Next question. Why create a model in parenthesis data class and a schema in parenthesis marshmallow when you can create both in one go with Marshmallow data class? Good question. So this is the answer. The same thing goes with the Pydantic schemas, right? You can create a model with a Pydantic schema. You can create a Marshmallow schema. But the thing is that your domain model should not depend on anything. As you see, 
uh, our, uh, like operands, it's pure class. It just use built-in Python, C Python data class. There's no third party dependence on it. If you burden or use third party dependencies in your domain models, you are in trouble on testing and also it's not a flexible enough. What we, the, the requirement for the domain models, it should stay the pure as it can be. And then you can extra, add an extra layer with a marshmallow or Pydantic. You can replace the schema here with a Pydantic. But the domain model doesn't care about what kind of technology you use. It's just a class. It's just the information. Thank you. One more question. Why do you keep the validation separate from the model? Good. Um, the obvious answer is that um, what I want to have a dependency flow uh, with the domain models, if I have created the object and in the constructor of object, I am going to validate the things, this is a reason to change my uh, domain model. If my validation changes in the future, this is a violation of single responsibility principle from the solid. The class should have only one reason to change and only one reason to change. The domain model change dictated by the business change, not the validation change or validation logic change. And that's why we have uh, shifted our validation outside of the domain model and stayed secure, validated, that uh, in, in, some, in the future, the business, uh, the, there's a kind of validation check. Now we want, for example, password length to be 10. I don't want to touch the domain model because it's a crucial part, it's the center, a heart of the complexity of our application for the simple reason that the password length has been changed. But instead, the validator should be responsible for the validation logic. This is a- answer. One more thing. This is a Django related question. I'm not sure if you are so much into Django. Django. Would you use a Django model to define the domain model or would you use Django only on the outside layer? With Django, it's pretty complicated because Django Orium is just the heart of the Django. It just directly starts from the Django models. And that's why it's quite complicated to apply some kind of architectures. But in, in this book, Architectural Patterns with Python, Bob and Harry, defined a way of abstracting things in a Django. So you can read the book. There's a kind of uh, appendix uh, about this topic. And uh, for the Django, uh, it's not, uh, how to say, not a, a, opinion, the framework in terms, it, it dictates the rules and it's MVT. So the Django itself is an MVC uh, or MVT framework. But instead, like Sanic, Flask, FastAPA and other stuff, is just open it, it quite uh, flexible on this. You can react to just things uh, with the different frameworks. Last tiny thing, maybe you will answer that later. I'm not sure. What are ports and adapters anyway? <laughs> um, yeah. So, maybe we defer that yes, to later yes, and yes. we go on with the presentation. Oh, one more question here from the audience. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, my question is uh, when I have a domain model. I really want to make sure that it is impossible to create uh, instances of the model uh, with inconsistent state. So I'm wondering, like, if you have certain rules in your domain model, uh, like of, of, of potential states that would be inconsistent or incorrect, how would you prevent them from being created? Um. The question is that to prevent direct creation of the domain model. This is this some, something like this? Maybe, maybe this, I think maybe this would be a solution, yeah. Uh, would, is there a way to do this? Or, or would mm -hmm. you have then a different validation in your domain model? Uh, how, how would you solve it? You can have double check mm -hmm. in your domain model, if you will, but I do not do uh, the validation inside the domain models, at least inside the value objects. But what you can do, uh, to, uh, so you define a contract in your team, in your project, that 
if you want to create a domain model, you should operate with the factories. And that this is the only way to create it. And this is the only way okay. of creating. And if you see some, some, some like merge request or pull request that the people trying to access the domain model directly just do not merge it. Okay, <laughs> I feel awesome. It. And um, this is kind of cultural change inside the team. Mm -hmm. So they should accept that there is no way to directly access domain models. There is some kind of, with DDD, yeah. they, they, you have aggregates, and you have aggregate root. It's uh, hard to hit. But with this kind of architecture, you should just, um, I don't know, give a workshop for your team that, hey, please do this in like this way, create a doc proper documentation on it. I don't know, create an RFC design record, all the stuff that we can go. Thank you. Thank you. Then let's go on for let's a while. Let's go on. Yeah, 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 sure, thanks. Uh, and now we are done with what? We are done with the calculator operates only with two numbers. We have created a value object or domain, first domain model. The second thing is add, subtract, multiply, and divide actions. What we can do with that? I'm going to create a service for this. You are going to have, a, you can call it domain service, or you can call it just a services layer. And if we cherry pick implement operands add action, inside the ports, we have created the services. And inside the services, there's an operands.py. And operands is an interface. In Python, we have no like Golang-like interfaces, but obviously we can force it with abstract basic, base classes. And operands service interface has this left and right um, add functionality, it's just adding, summing up, um, the, uh, summing up the numbers, obviously. But if you see that we have public method add, and inside the public method, we are returning the protected method. And the protected method, or private method, uh, underscore add, is an abstract method. What kind of question can arise here? We define operand service interface, and what is an interface? Interface is a contract. We agree that somebody who is going to implement our interface is going to implement this underscore add. Why we need it? There's a kind of open course principle from the solid, or from the solid. It dictates that the interfaces should open for the extension but should be closed for the modification, for the changing. And we have already shaked our hands, so we have agreed that we have a public ad. But in the future, if you want to change the behavior of this public ad, what, do, what to do? Just re-implement the uh, underscore ad. Do not touch the public, con public method, pu public contract, because we have already agreed. But if you want to change it, by a minute you want to extend it, then you are going to change this uh, underscore at and implement it in a different way. So imagine that you have a fancy thing that your calculator not adding but subtracting with the at. You fool the people. You can change down the at without touching the public at. This is a this is a naive way of achieving this uh, open close. Yeah. So you have a question here. Why do you uh, prefer this like templating pattern? I would call it in, in, instead of like just having abstract class. Where the ad function, public ad function, is abstract but has to be implemented by some realization. Yeah, it's a good question. But the thing is that um, the public method, you give a public method to the contract implementer, the interface who implements, and you agree that, okay, this is not going to change in the future, right? And in the, like at some point, if you need some kind of change, you are going back to change your interface. It prevents the change of the interface. You do not touch this public ad uh, inside, the, inside the interface itself. It's a one way of achieving it, but it's true that you can also use a uh, force that, uh, to re-implement the publics. But I can to re force to re-implement the privates, because the public, we have already agreed it. We, we, we don't want to re-implement the thing. There's a wide, uh, this, uh, design decision. Obviously, you can change it. But this is what, at least I think that it's uh, the proper way. But it's always, there's a better ways. And uh, this is a port side. So in the, uh, yeah, the question. Okay. I'm using Python, and I was wondering why you would use port in this case. Uh, because it's not 
Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm new to Python, so I did a bit of hexagonal architecture with Go, and you can use interface. But you don't have this concept of abstract classes, and I'm not super fan of inheritance, and I heard of protocols, but I wonder why not use protocols here, and why do you use abstract class? Uh, yeah, nice question. With the protocols, it's hard to ensure the integrity. So it's, it's just duct typing for the Python. There is no kind of runtime check if it's truly implemented the all kind of methods inside the interface. But with abstract-based classes, I can force it. I can raise a runtime error. It's not, not implemented error if somebody missed this. So that's why I am forcing the people that, hey, if you want to conform with my interface, with my contract, you have no other choice at implementing this. But with protocols, you can omit it. It's just close your eyes because there's no runtime check. Yes, implicit. So it's kind of I'm uh, defining that explicitly that, that you should uh, implement this. You must implement it, no, but you must implement This is a correct word. Can I continue? Yeah, great. This is a port side. As you see in a port side, we have services and interfaces. In contrast, in adapter side, we have services, but we have a concrete implementation of this interface. And in operand service, we inherit from the interface and create this uh, and implement this underscore at functionality. It's just creating a data dictionary with left and right. Then it validates with a marshmallow because we want to use this operands create DTO while creating our operands. And then we create the operands domain model, and afterwards we add these two numbers. So did you see the layers? The service hits a schema validation. The schema validation uh, calls, after schema validation, we call this domain factory. Domain factory creates a domain model, model and returns it back. This is an idea, so we have layered. And that means that we can have a test right now. Let's have a test for our service add functionality. Let's cherry pick and go to the test. We have the test services. For the test services, we, we are going to check the test operand service add result. We have this fixture called get operand service. If you go to the fixture, it just creates an operand service instance and returns it. You can use this later on with your tests. And we are asserting that, OK, actually, the addition was correct. Then the next test, the test operand service add with wrong data types. We're trying to inject the wrong data types to our service layer, but it will catch by the marshmallow that hits a validation error. We have covered our safety net with that. More unit tests. Yeah, sure, we love tests. Um, the test operand service add result, we are just adding a bunch of tests here also, and uh, uh, making sure that the left side and the right side, if you insert the wrong uh, type, it's going to fail with the validation error at the end. Uh, then it's kind of subtraction. It's a pretty simple. It's the same thing. We can go to operands and see that we have uh, at the end, this is a total same thing, and at the end we are going to subtract. The same thing for the multiply. I'm just going to quickly through that. The multiply is a multiply, and the divide is a divide. And this is a kind of um, encapsulated the actions inside the service. Uh, but if you see is that we have duplicated a court portions, and that's why I'm going to introduce a context manager, which is uh, quite neat. So from context lib import context manager, and here we are yielding the uh, actual operands domain model. And inside the service, we can use with operands factory validation, and it is indeed a factory validation. And then get the operands and return the, the actual result. So we have um, implemented the context manager in order to eliminate this duplication. <laughs> and also, we have extracted the validation logic out the service, as you see. Now it's the responsibility of the context manager, not the service, because it's a context manager validates the schema. 
And let's see, so what we have, okay, uh, obviously, <laughs> as this is the most um, well-known prominent uh, exception, zero division, and uh, now we can hit it here, but I'm going to show you uh, another pattern <laughs> called design by contract, or DBC, where you can cover your, um, your court portions with the contracts. So what we mean? If we go and cherry pick this defend, let's just go defend divide action from zero division using contract. And for these purposes, let me just go to the pipe project TOML. Inside the pipe project TOML, we have a new dependency called iContract. iContract is a library which is implements a design by contract pattern. It's quite powerful for your domain models. It has prerequisite post-requisite, and then it was an invariant check. If you have a question, what is a class invariant, it's a state that should be always true through the lifetime of your application or through the lifetime of the class. You can define the, uh, your invariant with the eye contract. And if you go back to the operands adapters, here we simply define that eye contract require right side to be not equal for specific divide action. This is a different thing, what we usually see in the tutorials. The, the most of the things that we are going to try accept, then catch the zero division, and then act according, right? And now you see that there's a contract. I require, before hitting my divide, the right side should not be unequal. It's a different kind of thinking. And uh, there's no need for, uh, for creating a validation to catch the exception inside the, the divide action. We have excluded, again, this responsibility outside of, of, of the service and delegated to the eye contract. Uh, what, what you can use for the eye contract, it, it has, uh, you can stack this. Um, uh, obviously, it's a decorator. You can stack the all decorators and create a different rules for your critical section. This is our critical section because I don't want to see the zero on the right side. That's it. And if we check the test, let's go back to the tests. Let's check if we, now we have concluded with the cherry picking, let's go to the test. And inside the test services, this is quite interesting. Just uh, maybe you can, um, you can see this. So we expect the not zero division error, we expect a violation error. This is a violation of the contract because we have defined that we don't want to see uh, the zero on the right side. And if you want to violate, you hit by the eye contract and that's a violation error. So you can check the difference. This is a validation error because it's a validates. It hits already there and validates. The violation is just you violate the rule. It's a different, um, like, mental thinking state, I'd say. And this is a quite powerful tool you can use for your applications. Just check it, designed by contract, DBC, iContract library. Quite neat. If we, uh, I, I want to uh, install it, and then for sure run the test, just to be sure that we don't make anything. 15 tests passed, green, we are done. We are pretty happy. Uh, yeah, the next. OK, the requirement has uh, been met, I would say. We have operands, we have the service. And now uh, the, this section, it should store the result of actions in the database. But we are interested in this first part. The question that we need to ask to like stakeholders, interested part, what is the action for you? And what is the result for you? And an obvious answer for our calculator, action is some kind of add, add multiply, divide, and uh, subtract. And the result is a result of these actions. And when you write down the words, OK, you should go back to the domain modeling, because you should model your ideas. And if you, um, yeah. So here, add calculation model and factory. I'm going to cherry pick. And again, once again, we are going to model. 
And now we have this uh, data class called the calculation. The calculation, something that has UID, unique UID, something that has left, right, action, result, and created at and update the, uh, at fields. Uh, the calculation factory is responsible for instantiating the uh, UID. I'm using ULIT. It is from Python ULIT. You can check why it's better than the ordinary UID4, but it's a, it's a different topic. And uh, you can, yeah, uh, you can check it on your own. Uh, let's just install it quickly, and it's installed. Uh, go back to the model. And here, if you, um, if you think about that, what we can have the differently, we can have a calculation class within it, the constructor, and we can create this UID inside the constructor. And once again, we don't want to do in any initialization for the domain models. We delegate it to outside the calculation factory, and it is now responsible for creating UIDs. It's also responsible for extracting the action type. An action type is an enum, which just predefines the actions. It's a quite simple. Add, subtract, divide, multiply, which has its own values. And the calculation factory is responsible for creating UIDs, for extracting the action type, for uh, instantiating the date time, this current date time. So all these responsibilities not burdened inside the domain model, but it uh, goes for the factory. The next. Um, we need to add a calculation create the, uh, the question. Uh, for the unit thing, you're kind of adding dependencies inside your model and putting your No. Please, please repeat. Uh, uh, the, sorry. <laughs> the question is that uh, with ULIT, we have added uh, dependencies for our domain model. Uh, but if you see our domain model, you are, we are storing string. Yes. In your case, both in the same module inside your domain, which is using it. Then you add the dependencies to the other. I don't know which one you how explicitly we should deal with this, but for me it feels wrong to add this kind of external library inside of the domain. Ah, you mean that why is the calculation factory use your okay, this is a good good question. The idea was that um, if your calculation factory depends for the third party library you can extract out from the domain model layer. That's correct, I totally agree. But the case of the simplicity, just imagine that it's a kind of extra layer. And uh, before you hit the, your uh, domain model, it go, goes to the factory, so. Are we gonna yeah, yeah, this is a, um, this is a good point, thanks. And uh, yeah, the next. We need to create a DTO for uh, our create model. Let's go to the schema. Add inside that. Um, so now we are pretty done with your, uh, uh, with your logic. So you say that you should extract out this ULIT and uh, I don't know, validation steps. Now we are extracting this to the outside schema. And inside the UID, we have this load default, which is a callable. We store it, we, we create a ULIT with our Marshmallow schema. Then we validate it that one of this is going to, so that the action should be one of the keys from the enum. And also we are creating the date times inside the schema and the class meta just uh, ignores the unknown exclude. Uh, and uh, let's go back, what's next? Change the calculation factory, amazing. So we need to change the calculation factory. The calculation factory now just accepts the UID. We have eliminated uh, your concern. And uh, here we uh, just add an extra layer uh, of the schema validation. So the UID creation and also the action, uh, UID creation is delegated to the schema. Now our calculation factory simply accepts any kind of information from the outside. Uh, obviously, I hit a circular import issue here, sorry for that, and I'm going to fix it. The, the idea was that um, we have now this kind of 
requirement inside the schema as well. This is a double check. The first, the so what we have, the first things that we have is uh, the schema calculation create detail is just validates against the strings and inside the model we have extra validation with the enum type. So it's a double check of that because the action part is a crucial is a crucial part uh, for us. The so next. Uh, obviously, I had a failing test, and I need to cherry pick the fixes. Let's go to the test then. With our test services, um, what kind of? I need, I need, I need. Ah, uh, what it was? Um, okay, so I need to test it. Yes, the old test have been passed. I need to find this uh, calculation model because I'm, I'm in the wrong place. I need to check the test domain models. This is it. This is a place there where we are, we are creating the calculation. So test if calculation model created with a factory. Calculation created here. Now calculation factory accepts just the keyword arguments. And if you go to the calculation factory, we have just changed it. We have added an extra check for, for the action as well. So there's a double check. Why? I'm going to explain it. Uh, so if you are going to test if calculation model created with factory with wrong action, <laughs> if it's going to, uh, if we are going to uh, use it with the wrong fake action, we hit the marshmallow, it says validation error, but uh, we can always bypassing. We can create a proper dictionary, then we can check the action, and then we, can, we want to inject this to our calculation factory. And because the enum checks this action, it fails at the enum level. So it's a double check, ensure that our uh, domain model uh, not, it's treated properly, I'd say. Um, and we have all tests passed. Good. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going in some randomized order. What if we want to add additional action type or types? Will we have to change the validation as well? Yes, sure. If you, you need to add an extra validation for a new, uh, new action type. That was obviously. Quick. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, you can you can centralize it. You can create some kind of common settings, and you can grab all kind of actions from the common uh, place. Or you can store it some kind of in a database with the supported actions, and you can insert a new action to the database and fetch there. There's a kind of different styles you can follow. Next one. How do you not confuse the database implementation storing details and the domain model? meaning that it's easy to pollute the model with too many details. Again? How do you not confuse the database implementation storing details and the domain model? All oh, right. Uh, so the question, I guess, is about uh, decoupling the ORIUM side or the database layer with a domain model. We will see it because we have this commit uh, regarding to this repository patterns and unit of work pattern, and then abstracting the Orium side from the domain model. The obvious solution is that when you start your application, you map your domain model with your Orium model, but it's only with the start. You don't need it anymore. So it's just started, mapped, and used. It, it, will, be, it will be clear in a moment. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um... Why do we specify the eye contract in the implementation and not the interface? Uh, in the interface, uh, we cannot force what kind of implementation the people should choose. We just give a contract that, A, you want to create this add or divide action, right? And the implementer is responsible for further actions, the validations. The interface is a just a public facing. So we ha I have this one, you need to implement. I have this one with two arguments, you need to implement it. You cannot force, or you should not force the people uh, stick with eye contract. It's a, it's a 
detail. It's a, like one possible solution. Maybe the people want to use a different solution. That's why. That's why it should uh, delegate to the implementer. Thank you. Why do you define double underscore hash, double underscore, or dun 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 hash, on a mutable data class? What must in, be immutable? On a mutable data class. Um, yeah, obviously the value object uh, you can use it as frozen true to make it immutable. But yeah, I have omitted this part that it, uh, it should not be checked. Uh, it should not be changed in the runtime. But we're creating a hash. Um, first of all, that uh, why I've created because I want to the, to make this object hashable, and want at some point to store it as a, for example, a key in a in a dictionary, my domain model, right? And uh, if you implement hash and equal, it's possible. This that was the reason for me at least. But if you know some kind of other. I don't know, anti-pattern, you can share it, obviously, so we can learn. Thank you, let's move yeah. to the next one. What is the effect of the meta class you added in the schema validation? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Let's just clarify it. Uh, so here, right, in a, in a schema validation, we declare that if the field is unknown, we need to exclude it. The reason is that somebody can try to inject some kind of fake field to the schema. And our system, instead of checking all the fields, checking the field count, I don't know, all the extra check, I'm going to exclude it. I'm going not to take it, to, uh, take it into account. This is a, the unknown exclude. So it's, it's a feature of the, the marshmallow. I just use it, yeah. Thank you. One more question live here, the audience. No, yeah. let's move on. Great. Uh, yes, and now we uh, are done with these requirements. We, it should store result of the actions. We have defined what is the result, what is the action. It's a calculation domain model. And this is a tiny part in the database. We love it. And uh, we are going to implement it right now. But we are going to abstract away the database implementation using repository pattern. Let's just go through Implement calculation <coughs> repository pattern. The cherry pick. Inside the ports, now we have these repositories. This is a kind of interface, you know. And inside the adapters, we have this calculation. The calculation SQL alchemy repository. From the name, it's clear that we are going to use SQL alchemy Orium for our purposes. It's related to the calculation and it is a repository. It implements calculation repository interface. What it has? It has this underscore add, which is adding. Uh, Self-session is, uh, is a connection to the database from the SQL Alchemy. And we are adding directly our domain models. Who sees the database models here? There's no database models. We map at the runtime the database models to our domain model. We operate solely with the domain models. We are adding to the database our model calculation. We get, using model calculation, filter by ID, get by UID, get by action, and get all. It returns a list of model calculation. This is just SQL Alchemist thing. So it's kind of ORM, uh, ORM style to getting, uh, uh, to executing SQL queries. We have abstracted all of those things away from our domain model schema validation services and other stuff. And now we have uh, the layer of the repositories. Uh, that means that we can obviously test it without no database. How to test it? We can fake our repository, add fake repository and the tests. What is a fake repository? We can go to the test, we can, hmm, amazing, fake repository. The fake calculation repository still implements the calculation repository interface, that means it does not violate any kind of interface. It still uh, conforms the contract. And uh, for the sake of simplicity or testing, we are faking the database with a dictionary. Then while adding the database, this is the actual insert, we just stores this random ID in a dictionary. When getting back from the ID, we just use this ID as a dictionary key. 
get by UID, we traverse from the dictionary if the, uh, the uh, UID is equal the UID that we are searching for, we return this uh, model calculation. And for the get all, we just return back the self database itself. Uh, obviously, uh, so expected type list calculation, but got dig uh, is a fake repository, so no need to bother to correct everything. Just, uh, just use it. And then uh, that means that we can test the repository. We can add a test calculation. So test calculation, test add calculation. We can, we can get, get fake repository, returning back a fake repository instance. You can check it from the, uh, from the conf test and uh, where it falls. Yeah. And uh, get calculation model object, which is another fixture in the conf test. We just create a dummy uh, uh, model and return it as a fixture to the test calculation. And then uh, we somehow add it. But obviously, it's an addition to the dictionary. But imagine that it's a true database connection and it's adding. There's nothing different with that. And the, you, are, you can get the dictionary values. You can test get calculation by UID. You can test get calculation by action. Test get all calculations. And for sake of the bravery, let's just install it and test it. Our repository test also pass. That means we have abstracted away our, uh, our database actions with a repository pattern, and even we write a unit test without a database. Because the database is here, is outside. It's a detail we don't need right now. We, we will need it in the future. Uh, the next. OK, obviously, with the databases, we need some kind of database migrations and also this ORIM. Now we are ready to work with a real database. This is the add Alembic configs. Uh, the Alembic config, Alembic has its own configs, and we store, I store actually in, in an adapters. In a DB, this kind of, uh, the, uh, the already like, uh, like Configuration, config change for, for uh, come from Alembics. There's not, nothing fancy here. The rest. Implement Alembic database migrations. I'm going to implement this. And now we have this Orient Pi. And this is a question answer to the question of how you decouple the database layer from the domain model. Uh, just install it in order to not to see this reds. Great. Uh, so with SQL Alchemy ORM, there are two types of the mapping. One is a declarative mapping. The declarative mapping is you, what you see with the Django models. You create a Django model, for example, model class user, it in, inherits from the Django model. And this is the declare, declarative way of uh, the actions. But there is another kind of mapper with the ORM, it's called classical mapper or imperative mapper. And we are using the imperative mapper here. We are creating a metadata, we register, we are creating a mapper registry, and we declare the table uh, imperatively, like manually, what kind of steps it should have. It should have ID, UID, left, right, action, result, created, add, updated, add, and a unique constraint. Uh, as you see, this thing is a new, uh, because it's uh, from the database, but the rest of, the rest of the column is a copy, like uh, the mapped copy of the, our calculation domain model. And SQL Alchemy understands it when you map it. So we define a start mappers. You have a bunch of 10 tables, right? You stack the ma mappers inside the start mappers function. And you register, the, the, you use mapper register with map imperative. We implicitly, uh, not implicitly, imperatively, declare that our model calculation mapped to the ORIAM calculation. And that way, we keep clean our domain models. We do not import any kind of ORIAM-like thing inside the domain models. Domain models still stays clean. Uh, but we have decoupled the ORIAM to the outside. And now, if you see the arrow, ORIAM itself depends on the model. model 
not depend. So you see that I wrote the dependencies on, uh, on a slide, and this is a true way of treating the ORIEM as well. ORIEM depends on the uh, domain model, but not domain model depends on, uh, on ORIEM. Yeah. Yes. Um, two more short things. The domain model data, data class used for SQL Alchemy as a data, sorry, one more time. The domain model data class is used for SQL Alchemy as a database table representation. What if the model needed a relation to another database table? Uh, that's a good question. This is a, actually a, the most naive way of implementation of domain modeling. Obviously, you need to have aggregates, aggregate root, and other stuff that acts uh, on top of the tables. But I usually what do, uh, if uh, you want to, uh, if you want to create a relation without domain models, you can create here with the ORIEM and define the relations in the map imperatively. So here you can define the relations. I believe it's kind of, uh, I need to find how it's doing. But this is a kind of thing that properties, yes, properties, you can define that, okay, model calculation and the calculation. Then imagine that, uh, uh, so you have this calc mapper, then a different mapper, stack of the mappers, and then you define the relation between the mappers. This is a way of how you can do it, the, the relation is imperatively. Thank you. Can one think of the domain model as the interface for the database, or would this be a reversing of the direction of dependency? Again. Can one think of the domain model as the interface for the database, or would this be a reversing of the direction of dependency? Uh, so. I guess the question is about if we can create a, a database models first and then then create the domain models on top of that or revert, ah, no, it's not the way that we should do because the domain model, our domain models is a simple. They has no business logic, they has no aggregate, aggregate rules, some kind of uh, other stuff in it. It's a, just a value object, but imagine that uh, you have this uh, big domain model which has a uh, hard like business logic, solving some kind of problem. It's nothing related to the database itself. Uh, it, it should, the domain model should solve the problem of the domain. Uh, and that's why you should first tackle with, with a domain model, no databases. Sorry. Thanks, yes. But now we have two places where the fields of the calculation model are defined. If we change the model, we will also need to change the table. Yes, this is a, uh, the idea behind this. If your domain model changed, then some, uh, the rest of the things should be changed because uh, this is a core of your application. And now, as you see it, uh, now ORM depends on the domain models. But imagine the vice versa. You are going to change the database tables, fields, and everything is breaking down. But at least with this strategy, your test will pass, except some kind of database tests. So well, I think if you use Alembic here, the, there will also be some sort of a migration process yes, sure, helping you. Sure, sure. And then you come back to the uh, like SQL Alchemy ORIEM to change the fields, then run, create a migrations, and then run the migrate. Right. One last thing, maybe. Why do you inherit the repository in fake repository instead of using the real one and mock the methods? Uh, this is a like battle between. Um, testing strategies that mock stops, I don't know if they're powerful. Uh, what I see, uh, the my idea relating to the mocks, if it's getting more, I lose attraction with the mocks. Where to, I did the mock, when I did the mock, why I did the mock. And this overcomplicates the testing strategy. And I am using the fakes. This is a, getting the same result, more clean way. And even your fake repository, like fake um, classes should conform with your, with your interfaces. By that way, you ensure that you do not violate the interface there as well. So uh, using real, uh, we are going to use the real, actually, uh, database connection, 
But with fake dependency injector container, it's nothing related to the actual database. We just, um, we, we just make a connection to the SQLite, if it's test, and then uh, the production database. But inside the dependency injection container, we will see it. Yeah. OK, if cool. We, we, have we have 12 more minutes to go. Oh, yeah. Moment, 12. <laughs> OK, let's just, uh, let's just go through quickly. Uh, and uh, at the end, we have uh, questions. Uh, so we have implemented repository, but we are missing the repository pattern, the atomic actions with the database. So we have not, uh, if you see that we have no commit and rollback things. For uh, creating this kind of stuff, we are going to use a pattern called unit of work, and let's just implement it quickly. Uh, we cherry picked, yeah. Uh, inside the unit, uh, yeah, we have an, so again, the port size is an interface. Let's just go with the adapters because it's real implementation. So cal uh, calculation SQL alchemy unit of work. The name indicates that this is the using the SQL alchemy. This is a unit of work pattern. And for the domain model of the calculation, it implements calculation unit of work interface. And we have defined this as a context manager with a class. What it has, it has a session factory. Session factory came from the uh, SQL Alchemy connection, this is the actual connection. When we use with uh, unit of work, we enter to this portion as a context manager, and we open a connection. We open a connection to the database when we need it, with. With unit of work, we have a connection. Then we have a calculation, which is calculation SQL Alchemy repository, so we operate on top of the repository pattern using this unit of work. And obviously when we, the context manager uh, exits, it's, uh, we are going to close uh, the database connection. We have commit, which is calling this SQL alchemy commit. We have this rollback, which is using this uh, session rollback, just SQL alchemy things. And obviously, we, need, we can test it, right? Uh, let's just first restructure our test folders now we have this domain reports to services uh, as a restructured uh, the test folders. And the next is uh, add fake unit of work. We have fake repository. We can use it inside the fake unit of work as pretty neat. Let's go back to the test unit of works and before that fake UAV. The fake UAV uh, we faking the calculation unit of work. Just we say that okay, self committed it false, and the self calculation. We do not need a session inside the enter because we have no actual database connection. That's why we have omitted it. But we inject the fake calculation repository inside, inside the the, the context manager, uh, and when we uh, the self commit is committed to rollback, just pass because we don't care about the rollback, nothing to roll back with a fake. And if you go to the test calculation UAV, now the magic happens here. With gate fake UAV, we have a great connection to the database. And then we use gate fake UAV calculation at. This calculation is a repository. This is an exact copy of the test, what we did in the repository, as you see. But the thing is that now we operate with the repository pattern, um, uh, repository pattern using uh, unit of work. We have added extra abstraction over the repository. And I believe that we can install it and then even hopefully test it. Yes, all tests are passed. So without any kind of database, we have operated to create an abstraction using repository and unit of work. We have fully tested it. Uh, yeah, magic. Good. Uh, the next. Just quickly, uh, so we don't need it. And now is the most interesting part that uh, we have unit of work, repository, domain model, and all the stuff, even OREM. But how the things wired up together? Now the dependency injection container comes to the land of the uh, workshop. And feature, add, add production DI container. Let's just cherry pick it. The DI container is a, con it's a thing that came uh, from the dependency injector library. It's a quite really neat and powerful library. You can use it. And if we go to the uh, layers, we have added this configurator, which has settings. 
the settings is just the DB URI, like database connection string. And I use uh, the like extracting methods for each settings as well. This is pretty neat and clean way. If you want the settings URI, just call this gate database URI and it will extract the proper settings for you. And inside the containers, so Achtung bitte, uh, the inside the container, uh, we have this containers declarative container, and we get the database URI, we create an engine, this is an SQL alchemy thing, as you see, we open, we create an engine, and we define default session factory, which is a laptop function with a session maker. This is an actual database connection, so it's going to open the connection, but we define as a lambda, it will be used later in a unit of work. We don't need to open a connection directly inside the de uh, dependency injection container. We delegate it. And calculation UAV will provide a factory. It's a provider. That means a dependency provider with actual calculation SQL our community of work. And we inject the session factory as a default session factory. Obviously, um, the thing is that yeah, if you go to the uh, SQL community of work, it expects a session factory and it's a callable. And indeed, we uh, just, uh, and indeed we, we just injected the callable with a lambda. So it's, it, 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 it gets what it expects. Uh, and uh, let's just install. I see some kind of weird reddish thing. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Fake container. Amazing. We need the fake container for faking our dependencies. And the fake container is, an, is, is a copy of, so hard code the DB connection, if you want here. Like, like a fake container should open a connection to the fake database, or SQLite at least, or your development. And you can create like the dev container, staging container, to manage your dependencies properly. And uh, from the settings, I believe uh, we have changed the settings. Now, if uh, the test runs there, we are going to return SQLite. If there is no test run, that means we are going to use a production connection. Um, that's pretty good. OK. We are going to implement the integration test. Uh, integration test I'm going to show, show, show immediately. Um, yeah, if we mark it as an integration, we get, uh, we get the calculation unit of work from the fake container. We actually add the cal uh, calculation model, then this is a true commit. This is a way that actual database used. And then we check that if the database has these uh, values added. So this is a, um, the, uh, uh, actually the like test, integration test for our working. We have fake tests with the calculation uh, unit of work. Now we have integration tests with the calculation unit of work. And that is, uh, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. The, then the next layer. But uh, I feel that we are running out of time, but just let's quickly freeze. Um, we, we add the next layer with a use case. Let's just go through the use case, and uh, I'm going to try to pick all of them, just not to, to not to waste the time. Getting all UIDs and getting all, and then immediately go to the adapters, and adapters we have these use cases, which is actual things that where everything wired up together. The calculate use case in her, uh, implements the calculate use case interface. It has unit of work dependency and it has a service dependency. The calculation unit of work interface and operands service interface. The question can arise, okay, wh wh is this it dependency is an interface. Where is the actual instances of this class? And this is the magic of the dependency injection container. It's injected dynamically by provider, dependency injection provider. And if you go to the container, we have the operand service, we have a calculate use case, and it injected to the uh, use case uh, in the runtime. As you see, we have this, uh, uh, we are checking from, we are getting the actual object from the dependency injection container using this um, key, uh, key, dict key notation. And then inside the add, we calculate the result, 
we save the information with the result, then we subtract, we multiply, and other stuff. We have this get all, get by UID, which is pretty the similar thing, so that we open a database connection, we get by UID, and uh, if we have the result, we return back as a dictionary. This is a use case. Uh, do we have time in a minute? Or? We still officially have some few more minutes, like okay. two or three or so. We have a number of questions. I'm, I bet there is more content on your slides, but I don't think we will have the time for all of it's it. It's just the last part, the, the fast API. Then rush through yeah. it, maybe, <laughs> if you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, we have this, that everything is placed. And then uh, we have this adding fast API calculation. And let's just quickly go through the entry points. Entry point is a is a layer that we hit enter to our application. We have API, we, we have v1 and root calculate. Let's just cherry pick everything. And here you, yeah. Just address the questions because I can go through the commits at home already. Okay, sure, 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 thank you. So obviously people are asking for the questions. Okay, yes, then we switch much. over to the uh, remaining questions. Um, finally, the one waiting here for the longest time, what are ports and adapters, by the way? It's uh, another name of the hexagonal architecture with, uh, uh, the, from the original uh, author, and uh, the name is ports and adapters architecture, but the people name it like hexagonal as well. So as you see, the ports is a contract, that, putting it simple, the adapters is the actual implementations. So ports and abstraction, an interface, and adapters is actual implementation of these interfaces. Putting it simple. How but easy, thanks, how yeah. easy is it to change the database adapter and use a non-database storage? For example, JSON or some text file. Uh, as we have decoupled our domain model from the ORIM side, you can shift with ORIMs anytime. At which point should I use a more enterprise suitable programming language? AKA, should a service like this even be implemented in Python? Uh, this is a question that um, what we struggle with. Uh, so Python is considered for a long period of the years as a scripting language, but we love it and know that it can be applied to the enterprise level as well. But the thing is that we were missing the teaching materials on enterprise architectures, specifically implementation as a Python uh, versus Java or C Sharp, because they have been using this for 15 years or 10, 20 years. And this is a relatively new thing for the Python ecosystem. I bet that the Python can be used in any kind of application complexity. And there's one last one here on the list, which makes a last overall question. What advice would you give a developer to not overthink the solution, think technical implementation, and focus on the domain and not mix the different layers? Uh, that's a, the hard question, but the thing is that we should change our the mindset on how we are going to develop the application. The first thing that we should adopt in ourselves asking a lot of questions, understanding the domain, what kind of problem we are going to fix, to asking a lot of questions to the stakeholders or your manager, I don't know, team lead, try to understand the domain and then fix this with fake repository, with, I don't know, you, know, you don't need the database, you can store it in a TXT file as well, right? But you can show demo something. And the thing is that if uh, your application your, your code just fix the core domain problem, the rest of the, uh, of the things are details. So just focus on the domain, what kind of problem you are working with, and fix it first. Then think about, oh, we need to choose a framework, and uh, we need to cho choose a type of the database, we need to choose, I don't know, where to store the logs, where to store the monitoring metrics and other stuff. This is all the details. Thank you very much. I think that was a very nice I think that was a very nice exercise in adding a lot of overhead to a simple calculation as we have seen. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, I think you will also agree that uh, on larger systems this will pay off. Yes, definitely. This is the idea. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>